This is Brian Wood with Back to the Roots Podcast. Before we start today's episode, I want to put a plug in for our first advertiser, the Organic Farming Conference. This event is held each year to encourage working the land for future generations and supporting a community that is prosperous and enduring. This year, the Organic Farming Conference will be November 8th and 9th at the Mount Hope Event Center in Mount Hope, Ohio. Speakers will include past guests of the podcast, such as Gary Zimmer, Brent and Regina Beidler, Sam Dobson, and Joe Schleba, as well as many others. Please go to www.organicfarmingconf.com. That's www.organicfarmingconf.com to learn more or sign up to attend. And thanks to the Organic Farming Conference for sponsoring our show. Now on to the today's episode, which is with Dave Osterloh, who shares some good stories of the history of his farm and his transition to organic and is a great guy to talk to. Hope you enjoy. You're listening to Back to the Roots podcast. This is Brian Wood, and today Mike Klein and myself are sitting down with Dave Osterloh in Minster, Ohio, which is in western Ohio, uh, where Dave is a dairy farmer. There's a lot of history uh, uh, with Dave and his farm and a lot of generations that have been in this area for a long time. Um, and I think that's kind of what we wanted to talk to Dave a little bit about today and, and his transition to organic. Um, and so Dave, thanks a lot for sitting down with us. If you want to start with an introduction and a little bit of background, that'd be great. Well, like I said, my name's Dave Osterloh. I'm the fifth generation farming here. Uh, my son, Bob, hopefully will be the sixth. I don't know where exactly you want me to start. Um, so we, it's all I've ever known. <laughs> At uh, Well, if you go back to when, what brought the family over here in the first place? And um, did they, did they the home farm where you're farming today, did they own that? And, and how is that kind of, that those trans- transactions gone? Well, actually, it'd be my great, great, great uncle came over first. He was a land agent. Uh, the reason the, they came over from Germany there was no future there. I mean, the, it was to the point at that time, the eldest inherited the farm and he was responsible for all of, his, all of his younger siblings and none of them were allowed to marry unless they were able to pr- prove that they had a source of income because there just was not enough land and that was the German government's answer was you just, and the so there's all these siblings with really no future. And what happened was there was a guy by the name of, uh, Joseph Stallo came over from our, the same area our family's from, and he got a job in Cincinnati with McGuffey Reader. He he worked in the printing office, and he made trips up here and it saw what kind of land this was. And well, back in Cincinnati, he had access to a printing press, and he started printing broadsheets out of what this land was available and everything else, and. Starting in, in the 1810s, 1820s, these broadsheets started making their way back to Germany. And by the 1830s, they were, the, Germany was draining out. I mean, literally, my great-great-great-uncle came over here in 1833. He was a land agent. He had bought a bunch of land. Didn't actually farm much. He was, he was making his money on transactions of land, you know, just get things settled. And he got sick in, the, uh, in a typhus epidemic and died. And his brother came over in about 1834, 1835. He took things over. His brother was 20 years old. Wow. And he literally took everything over and ran with it. And the interesting thing is he came over. I cannot think of his wife's name right now, but she was a worman. They were married as soon as they hit the United States. They were not allowed to marry in Germany. But they got here, they got married. That's the main reason they came over here. They couldn't marry or anything. Mm-hmm. And they started buying land up in this area and transactioning. And actually where our family first settled is a little burg called Egypt. I took Brian through there. It's, there's a Catholic church and a Massey Ferguson dealer, but uh, a couple of houses. But uh, our, our original home farm went out of the family through marriage. But that's they gave the land for the build the church. There was a co- convent next door to it. All that was our family land. And we're... What we call the home farm now was bought from a fellow who had only daughters. It was a Stukenberg. They bought it from him, and that became home base, and they sort of built up from there and ended up being uh, 
by my grandfather's generation, there was four brothers farming, and now they're all gone but our family. The, re- really? the rest of that, that generation, the kids all got out of it. Uh, but it, it was the interesting thing. It was John Henry, or as they say, Jan Heineck, and his y- younger brother, Jan Allard. They all started with John, but they went by the middle names. And then the next generation was Joseph Anton, would have been my great-grandfather. His son, Alos, I showed you the, the, the big brick house. That, that's the one that uh, Joseph Anton built for his wife. Mm-hmm. And then my grandfather, Alos, was born there. My dad, Ivo, was born there. I was born there. And all of us raised there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we just sort of worked through the, it's just held on through the generations. Mm-hmm. My dad's had the worst of it. He, uh, when he was 18 or 19, he went to Columbus to get a state FFA degree. Minster School's the start of a WAG program. And uh, his dad didn't go. Uh, they went to Columbus. When he got home, his dad was dead. Oh, wow. And he when had, he was 18. When he was 18. His oldest brother was in Korea. The second oldest one was the one that found him, and it, he, it rattled him so bad he couldn't hardly handle himself. And then the next oldest one from there was in the Catholic uh, high, high school seminary. So he wasn't home. So it was up to my dad to sort of, my dad and his uh, brother-in-law sort of pulled everybody along. He also had uh, four younger siblings. The only other brother was just a child. I mean, maybe, maybe five or six, you know, and dad literally drug everybody along and kept the place going. My, my grandmother was a dear sweet woman, but she was so rattled she couldn't function. Mm-hmm. You know, and he basically took that over when he was 18, and he didn't turn it over to me until he was over 78 years old. He just could not let go of it. It's all he had of his dad. Mm-hmm. How old was his dad when he passed? Uh, Grandpa would have been, um, oh, I wrote it down, 55. Okay. Late 50s. It was the money problems and the depression and everything else mm-hmm. and just ill health. Mm-hmm. Actually. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's... So it's, it's but it's it's easy to see why your dad couldn't let go of the farm. Yeah, like that was all he had. You yeah, know, that's all he had of his dad. Mm-hmm. You know, it uh, well, and that's why I don't live there. He just couldn't bring himself to move out of that house. Mm-hmm. And I no 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 hard feelings. I understand mm-hmm. that totally. Yeah. But then you know, I I came along. My poor dad. I was the oldest of six, not the okay. youngest. Oh, you're so the oldest. I when I graduated in 1977, he was only 42. So he had this, you know, 19-year-old little shit telling him things that he wasn't about to put up with this stuff, and it was war. He kept trying to get me to get a factory job, and, well, I didn't last too long in the factories because murder's against the law. Uh, there was some foreman were going to get it with a ball-peen hammer. And I find us ended up at home. Uh, we I did a lot. The worst part was I started farming in, might as well say, 78, 79. Things were really rolling. Bought this place where I live now. It was one of the highest priced farms in the neighborhood, but how often you buy land is three quarter mile away from home. Mm-hmm. So we bought it. Two years later, the bottom fell out of the farm market. And all of a sudden, yeah, it was one of the highest priced farms in the county. <laughs> and I couldn't back out on it because dad had co-signed. He and I had sat down and he did more of the figures than I did. And he had figured it up to like 16, 17% interest. And yeah, it worked. We paid 21% interest. Whoa. I mean, you're... The old saying goes, you're selling the seed corn. You're eating the seed corn to survive. And I, I worked in factories. I, uh, there's a fabricating shop just next to the home place there. And uh, I would go in for two years. As soon as we had the crops off in the fall, I would go in as soon as we were about three quarter done milking and I worked till midnight every night going over blueprints with a couple of guys. I knew how to read prints. To go over all the day's work they put out, they build I-beams for highway, mostly highway overpasses in Ohio he builds over here. Mm-hmm. You know, go through every one of them, make sure the jobs were right, correct things that need to be corrected, mark stuff, do a little welding. I also ran a fabricating shop out of, of uh, that shop there at, our, at the farm. Guys would bring loader buckets in and drop them off and put new bottoms and cutting edges and rebuild the runners underneath. I built bale conveyor systems for about five or six barns in the area. Anything to make a buck. And that would have been in the 80s? Yeah, that had been all through the 80s. Uh, got married in 85, and I was when I was really doing a lot of welding work, uh, 83, 84, 85, 86. Just, you know, anything I could do to make an extra dollar. 
Mm-hmm. I bought, I had what, the first John Deere self-propelled chopper in the state of Ohio. I was out filling, or at least within a 50 mile radius of here. And I was out custom filling silos to make extra money. You name it. We did just a scratch to get by, mm-hmm. but we made our way through it. And now I look around, I'm afraid we're going right back into the same thing again. Mm-hmm. It scares the hell out of me. The only difference right now is it's not 20% interest. No, but the milk price absolutely stinks. Uh, you know, if you're conventional, I don't know how these guys are doing it. Mm-hmm. Got a neighbor kid here. Just, I know how they're doing it. I know his dad. He's a hell of a hell of a businessman. But he paid several million dollars for a 150 cow setup, machinery house, and everything. That just don't work in this market. I don't see how in the world it's working. It. I don't know. It's. It's. Uh, I look at my son, and he he wants to milk cows. And just gung, Bob's gung ho. Mm-hmm. I keep looking at him, you're out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to step back a little bit, you transitioned to organics then in the early 2000s, correct? Well, see, and that's sort of the, the funny part. My dad has been on a strict rotation since he was in high school. You know, it's, you're, you're talking years and years. That this farm's always been farmed on a pretty strict rotation, and the soils have always been built up. Now, where I live, it's a little different story, but I'm talking about the home place. And Dad never did spray a lot to begin with. I mean, he, used, he always said they used anhydrous one year, and so anything had to smell that damn bad, it was never setting foot on this farm again. And, uh, you know, he, he never was... Dad did a hell of a good job, don't get me wrong, but we were never the ones pushing for the highest yields and trying to always you know, impress the neighbors who did it to make money. So transitioning into organic, I would played around the edges of it for years. But there was no market, no milk market. It, uh, you know, and for us, we fed what we grow and we grow what we feed. So if there was no milk market, organic was not worth the, the, the aggravation. And then I, in fact, one year, the first year I was going to certify, I had already sent the paperwork into Betty Cananan, GOA, and it got to the point I thought I was going to have corn to sell. And things didn't look so hot. And I called Betty and canceled it. I said, I can't afford to pay the inspector. She she about flipped out. I said, I, I, I just can't do it. What year would that have been? That would have been like 2001, okay. somewhere in there, 2000, 2001. Before there was any or any or milk around any here. Any milk around here. Right. I, I thought I saw a chance I could sell some you know corn for, at that time, it was like a do- dollar and a half or two dollar premium. Wow. You know, that would have been good money. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't afford to pay the inspector to get the inspection done. That's how tight we were we were running things, you know. It uh, and then uh, you've probably met Joe Hammond from up north. Yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't know him. He sent me a letter out of the blue. He said the milk inspector told him there was some other person who was interested in organic, and we sort of got to know each other. And we had had a meeting with Horizon, and they threw a smoke screen. Like by the time she got first, they wanted our milk. By the time they got here. There was going to be so many hauling fees on it, there wouldn't have been any advantage to it anyway. And then we got had a meeting with um, Jim Wiedeberg. I will forever thank him. He was going to, the original plan, he was going to fly into Dayton. And then call me when he got to Dayton and ask for directions how to get up here. Well, through the night, I guess he had had a jersey calf. His boy got him out of bed. Dad, if you don't help me, this guy's going to die. So he was up late pulling a jersey, slept through the alarm. So he, by the time he got to the airport at uh, La Crosse, the plane was already leaving. So he just drove right over to Madison, tried to get on it there. It was booked. He couldn't get on it, so he just started driving. Which, you know, a hired suit would have just called and said, hey, I'll see you next week or something. Mm-hmm. You know? So I had just got my first cell phone. I was out raking hay. I won't even tell you where I hit the cell phone so I could feel the damn thing vibrate. I was so damn worried I'd miss the call. <laughs> and finally, I called him. I said, Jim, where are you? You should be at the airport by now. Oh, I'm just driving through Indianapolis. Indianapolis? What are you doing in Indianapolis? Well, I mean, he told me the whole story. And he said, I just figured I'd drive to Dayton and then ask for directions. You should have called me sooner. I could have saved you about three hours of driving. And he just said, oh, well, I'm seeing nice countryside. You know, but he made the effort to get out here, and we ended up with a pool. When he finally told us in the middle of 2003, to, and we were on the 
that wonderful program before a blueberry grower who didn't have a damn thing to do with dairy and didn't know how to mind his own business destroyed it. Uh, we'd all, I'd be on 80, 20 and he said, we'll be ready by fall. And I said, you've got to be kidding. It was me and Paul Schmidtmeyer who lives, that's about 18 miles uh, south of here. Joe Hammond, who's two and a half hours north. And Steve Ganvey, it was two hours east. Mm-hmm. And that was the pool. I said, you can't make this work. And he goes, oh, well, we've lost our ass on pools before. Do we get them going? It'll work. And I've come to find out all he was picking up was me and Paul. He was paying Gamby and, and Hammond, just paying them the difference to keep them organic until they could get a route worked out. No kidding. Yeah. And I was beating my tail on roads around here, trying to get people interested, trying to, you know, because I was scared silly they were going to, you know, about a year or so they're going to say, this isn't working anymore. You know, we can't do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jim was after me to keep track of all my hours and all my phone calls. And I said, Jim, I can't keep track of all this. We just made a deal. Whenever you come out, buy me dinner. I, I just I just couldn't see myself trying. You know, he had told me there's people really work that for every penny. And I said, no, I just can't do that. But uh, it was, I got to think here now. It was two years later. Dan, I think it was two years later, Dan Fullenkamp got on the truck, two or three. And he had, he had sort of played around the edges a little bit too, not quite in the same way I had, but it really went against his university education. And his sister was in the state vet's office, and that was really kind of like a real departure for him. But he got, in, got interested in it. We have Leroy Meyer. He was a grazer long before anybody knew what the hell grazing was. And he got interested there was Ron Pohl. Uh, he actually married my cousin. They they were interested before I knew it and just sort of happened to talk to me at a family function. Okay. You know, it, it just sort of came together. Chris Dollinghouse, that one surprised me, but he made the comment one time. He says, I watch you plow and you got earthworms and I can't find a one. Mm-hmm. You know, and it just it sort of went from there. We've lo- gained a few, lost a few, but, mm-hmm. you know, I haven't seen to been able to get to grow beyond this, mm-hmm. you know, the six or so that are here. And this is a pretty traditionally heavy dairy country, right? Well, when Jim first asked me about it, he says, well, are there many cows out there? I said, this is Wooster West. Or Wooster East. Or no, yeah, Wooster West. I said, there's, there's as many cows, just fewer bigger herds. Mm-hmm. And there really is. Home, this is, this is there's, at that time, there was as many cows here as there was in Holmes County. Mm-hmm. Just as not as many dairymen. There were more 40 and 50 cow herds instead of 10 and 12 cow herds. Now, have you lost a lot of dairy around here the last 10 years? Or Numbers, it- not so much. Dairymen, yes. Okay. Yeah, herds I'm- just got bigger consolidated? Yeah. Kind of like the dairy industry in general? Well, my son and I were talking about it one day, and I, I stood in the yard, and I said, Bob, he milked cows, he milked cows, he milked cows, he milked cows. They're all empty. Or they got steers in them. Or they've been sold, and somebody else owns the buildings and rents the house out. You know, it's the, I'd say actual number of dairy herds... They've dropped by 65 percent around here. Oh wow! But the the other ones that are left, and a lot of those were the 12, 15, 18 cows. Some of them just hung on. One neighbor over here, they're, they're good old guys, two bachelors, and they kept milking fifteen cows as long as they could to keep the insurance up. And once they both found on Medicare, the cows left. Mm-hmm. You know that that they, they, they would. It wasn't quite subsistence, but you know what I'm getting at. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, with some neighbors over here, one of them, he, there was two neighbors. I said, I'm not going to quit. Um, Ed said, I'm not going to quit milking cows. The water quits milking cows. And they both were up. Uh, Ed was up into his late seventies when Walter died of a heart attack in the dairy barn. So they both quit. <laughs> wow. So, um, when looking at going organic was first of all, start with yourself. Like you were kind of part way there already. And we met your parents before we come over here, and it sounded like it was a bit of a, of a. Uh... My dad had a high-end registered dairy herd, and he finally realized that. See, my dad was one of the upstarts before. Originally, our uh, registered dairy wasn't northeastern Ohio thing. I mean, the the Ohio Holstein Association office is in Worcester. Mm-hmm. You know, they and they really didn't like it that these upstarts in Western Ohio were getting into registered cattle. 
And all of a sudden, there was, uh, the older people listen to this, they remember Straight Pine Elevation Pete. My dad was in the syndicate that proved him. He's had several other bulls with his name in the bull studs. Um, I can remember that at one time we showed at, I believe, six county fairs, the county black and white show, or the state black and white show, and the state fair every year. Because that's how you promoted your breeding, was oh, at the wow. county fairs. Yeah, we'd... I got to think here. Oglaze, Mercer, Dark, Shelby, State Fair, Van Wert, and there was a black and white show every spring. And we, that's, and Dad took a full string. Mm-hmm. One, one, one or two in every class. You know, and it was a lot of work, but he really was moving registered cattle. And over the years, the registered business has swung back to the big boys. The money boys are, are about running the thing now. Registered has really sort of tapered off. And honestly, the dairy herds today, my dad said when he started in registered cattle, when he got out of the army, his brother had bought two Holstein heifers. They had they had uh, milking shorthorn before that, but you either had purebred cattle or you had brindles. You didn't know what they were. They were bred by something down the road, and now anymore, the average grade herd is as good as any registered herd around because mm-hmm. they're all breeding to the same bulls and the same bloodlines. So they sort of sealed their own fate in a way. But it was, so the, the 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 small guy in the register business just isn't it, he can do it, but it's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And we just decided to go this route. Um, a good friend of my dad's is a cattle buyer, and he said registration papers on on Springer heifers anymore is a detriment to oh, sell. Really, people just don't want want to deal with it, you know. Mm-hmm. So we finally just stopped registering the cattle. It just wasn't worth the money because that was our old, real market, which is Springer heifers, and. Uh, We've come to this point now, you know, we're, we're grazing cows. Oh, my God, I'm, you're going to destroy his registered herd. No, I'm trying to make money. Mm-hmm. It, uh, we, <clears throat> pardon me, the whole organic thing was, oh, it's a long story. Played with it, played around with it. You ever heard of a magazine called The New Farm? I do remember that. I was an avid reader of The New Farm, what they call the Regen Ag movement, you know, the or some guys called it low low input low income, mm-hmm. but uh, we I always told people no I'm they say, oh you're organic I said no I'm just broke. Uh, <laughs> the uh, I'd played around the edges of that for quite a while, and like I said there was never really a market for the milk here so we didn't I didn't pursue the organic market. And I got married, uh, my oldest child my daughter, she was conceived and carried on a place we rented down the road here. And my second son, Ben, was born with what's called Arnold Chiari syndrome. He was basically carried here. There was two 12-foot deep wells on this farm. Very good water. The uh, previous owner raised 13 children in this house. None of them had problems other than the fact they were all a bunch of stinkers. I mean, they were, they were a wild bunch of kids, but they were good. And here we come with this problem, birth defect with our son. By the, t- in the in the first few years, he had to have a decompression surgery because he had too much. First, he had to have a shunt put in, fluid build up on the brain. It's an enlargement of the, of the brain stem. Okay. Usually, it's accompanied by spina bifida. He did not get that. He had to have a shunt put in. He could not walk. He would belly crawl, so they had to take a piece of his skull away in the back, take the pressure off the brain stem. Within three days of the surgery, he was on his hands and knees, and a week later, he was walking. Wow. Uh He's a little socially awkward, uh, physically awkward, but he's a very, very smart guy. Uh, he's got other problems, but still, it got us looking. And I had sent a wat- water sample into the health department. And I, without thinking, I just marked it a farm sample, and it always came back fine. I finally sent one as a house sample. It was loaded with atrazine. Hmm. We had used atrazine on the corn because we had a lot of grass problems over here. Well, okay, you start freaking out. And someone made the comment, well, yeah, but your kid's just one in a million. I said, when you're one in a million in the brain surgery unit at Children's Hospital and you sit there for three hours wondering what you're going to do till they get done with them, it changes your whole outlook on one on your one in a million. Mm-hmm. You know, And that sort of led us down the road to just trying to do away with it. You know, I, we didn't, and that isn't just, it was an overnight change, but it's what drove it, mm-hmm. you know, to get to finally make that leap and get after OV or somebody to buy our milk and see what we could do. 
that's why Joe Hammond was so aggravated. He could see those trucks going from uh, Holmes County to Organic, Organic Valley right on the interstate just north of it. And I keep trying to turn out in front of one and flag it down. Now you can pick me up on the way. <laughs> you know, until we, we finally got it going. Mm -hmm. It was, and there were other things along the way. I uh, I, said, I just thought the soil looked healthier. We we had trouble with alfalfa weevil one year. And there was a fellow down quite a ways over by Covington by the name of Nelson Apple. He was big into compost and low input farming and I got talking to him and he says, well, you don't need that. Um, uh, Lord's band for that. And he says, you just spray it with two quarts of molasses and two ounces of, of peroxide in you know 20 to 30 gallon of water. Spray that on your alfalfa. He said, they'll stop feeding. Once the hay matures, then you can just cut it off and they're done. And that year, the neighbor up here at the highway, I won't say his name, but he's now organic. But he had sprayed his alfalfa with atrazine. I sprayed mine with the molasses. He says, well, how do you guarantee that? Will that, will that work? And I said, it cost me 25 cents an acre. What have I got to lose? <laughs> you know, he ended up, you know, there's a window you have to wait till with atrazine or with uh, Lorsban till you can mow. Mm -hmm. Every time he get to within about four or five days of that window, the weevil were tearing it up again. So he'd spray it again. And he got to that window again, and he sprayed it again. He sprayed his alfalfa three times until he finally just gave up and left to meet it till it went to bloom so he could so he could cut it and after that he really started looking at what i was doing and i just hey you know i made no guaranteed work it's just something worked mm -hmm. for me but and that did work well it worked real well mm -hmm. it doesn't kill them but they just like they they hang there like they're drunk you know mm -hmm. they just don't they quit feeding they don't like all that sugar and the weevil will just stop feeding and it gives you enough time to the hay can mature. And once you mow it, the weevil's done anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, uh, and my dad had worked around at one time. He was using flamers for weevil. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. There was uh, three years running. He went to the molten gas up here, and there's a big LP tank on a wagon chassis with a whole row of burners. And you go out early in the spring, light that up, and squirt your hay fields. And he did test strips where he'd, you know, skip strips. Everywhere he skipped, the weevil was eating it. All it did, it just fried, fried the eggs, literally oh, fried gotcha. the eggs when they went through. Hmm. And the third or fourth year he went to get the rig, they didn't have it anymore. He says, well, what happened to it? Oh, we cut it up for scrap. They said the chemicals are more efficient, and we, we, nobody's going to do it anymore. Hmm. It's little things like that that stick in my mind, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that over the years just made you wonder what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like I said, with my son, that led us towards some of it. And, and man, oh, man, about the time we started... I decided I was going into grazing one way or the other. We were setting the fences. My neighbor came over and said, you know, if things are that bad, I can rent it and farm it for you. <laughs> I thought I'd lost my mind. And then we had sowed uh, oats with uh, pasture blend in it. And the clover was as tall as the, pa the grass on that pasture blend. His son asked my son, when are you going to spray that? And get the grass out of those beans. <laughs> <coughs> you know, so we were, mm -hmm. and you know that I lost my youngest son. He was three years old. We lost him in a farm accident right here in the yard. Oh, wow. And I, there's a whole chunk in there I don't remember. Mm -hmm. There's about a year, year and a half I don't remember a whole list of things. You know, and all of a sudden I'm sitting here in this world and we're organic and everything's rolling along. And mm-hmm. If it wouldn't have been for my dad holding me up, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have functioned. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, dad, dad and dad and God and my wife, that's about all that kept you going. Mm -hmm. They had to I get can, the work done. I can believe that. And you said you're, you took over the farm when your dad was 78? Uh, that's on paper. Oh, dad will be in that house. Yeah. Uh, da Dad's running the show forever. Well, <laughs> no, but I value his opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. I go in and talk to him every day. Mm -hmm. I, I need somebody to somebody to bounce things off of. And, and he's been at this a lot longer than me. He's mm -hmm. some. It's amazing. Once in a while he'll start laughing. I said, what's funny? He goes, hmm, been through that one twice before. <laughs> or you mean, you know, also you'll read something in a. Farm magazine, yeah, they tried that in the fifties, didn't work then either. And, <laughs> but they're doing it bigger this time. Because when we talked to him earlier, he said he started milking in fifty-seven mm -hmm. in that barn. 
Him and his brother were milking 80 cows in the 50s. In a three-on-one-side side-opener surge parlor. Four hours. Four to a- mom was being polite. More like five. Okay. It, it took us two and a half hours to milk 40. Wow. That, that is somebody who's not afraid to work. Well, my dad was a working fool. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, uh, they remodeled that entire barn, tore the trash floors out, ran I-beams through it, put lofts in it, through the whole barn. That barn got blown full of loose, loose hay and loose bedding for a number of years, and they started packing it full of hay and half of it and loose bedding in the other half. And They had all those cows in one loafing pen. Can you imagine how much bedding that took? Mm-hmm. And they were putting silage up in a silo made out of snow fence hmm. lined with tar paper. You start out with a 20-some 20, 20 some, 20 foot ring with tar paper, and you just put another one on top of it that's maybe about 19 foot in diameter, and another one top's about 18. They get up to 35 feet like that. And forked that off all winter to feed the cows. <laughs> you know, and we, uh, Dad always said he put that first 20 by 60 cement silo up. It was the first 20, 60 silo in the area. And the neighbors just kept gossiping. There's no way in hell he's going to fill that. He doesn't have enough acres. He's only got 120 acres. How in hell is he going to fill that? <laughs> you know, and now, well, I, like Dad said, even then, he's at 20 good acres of corn. He could fill it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was just so big at the time, but. They were just milking that many cows. Mm-hmm. They would have been like the biggest dairy here. They were probably one, when he and his brother were milking together. They were one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, there was actually it was a loose partnership. There was Jerry, Dad, and Irvin, and Otmer. The, the the four boys that farmed out. The other one was in the seminary, and then Jerry worked his way out of it and worked in the factory. He never really was in it too far. When Otmer got married, he moved to his own farm over at New Weston. Then he and Irvin really got into the dairy cows. And then, you know, they, they kept building that up and building that up. And then Irvin got married, went on his own on another farm. And he eventually moved to Wisconsin, sold his farm out here and moved to Wisconsin. But he didn't farm up there? At Wisconsin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he, he farmed quite a bit of ground. He says, rent's cheap up here. <laughs> <laughs> he, but he didn't milk cows up there. Oh, he didn't. No, he sold the cows. His wife had phlebitis, and he was having other problems. And it just he was more of a crop farmer than a dairy farmer. And uh, he's done quite well for himself up there. Isn't it amazing how in a matter of 50 to 60 years, an 80-cow herd here was huge. huge. Yeah. And nowadays, 80 is tiny. Yeah. And we're up to 8,000, 10,000, yeah. 20,000, 40,000 in India. It's called progress. Yeah. <laughs> and yet they still aren't making any money. No, well, you've heard the old hay truck joke. You know, this is all the monster. Well, we didn't make any money. We need a bigger hay truck. <laughs> you know, it. it uh, yeah, it, it's it is it's 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 amazing. It's frightening. I got into it with a university professor one time who just plain got aggravated with me. He says consolidation will happen forever. It's just the way things are. I said, great. Then will you tell me where that one dairy herd east of the Mississippi and the one west of the Mississippi will be located? <laughs> Well, it'll never get that far. You just said it will It will continue forever. So at some point, it has to run out. It has to. You know, and he did, boy, he did not like me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of people don't like me because I tend to, as I get older, the filter gets thinner. <laughs> well, I didn't realize you had one. <laughs> at one time, I had more than I have now. Okay. <laughs> well, oh, my yeah. grandpa, grandpa Bolscher always told me, if you don't speak your mind, no one will ever know what you think. <laughs> you know, wrong. if you're always just sit in the corner and be quiet. Mm-hmm. I, that's where I get the oniness from. Is he was full blood French, and that's where I get the oniness from. Is my mother's side. I'm a quarter French. Nice. <laughs> they were another product of the depression. Mm-hmm. His dad died when he was young, and there was no money. His his mother had said he had, his mother had five boys, and she says you're going to be on your own. The insurance insurance company failed. There's no money, and he made it on his own. Him and my wow. grandmother worked their tails off. Mm-hmm. So uh, going back to your dad, and you know he was doing his thing from '57 all the way up until you know you came on the farm in the, you said the late '70s. Right? I graduated high school in 1977, and basically he hasn't never been able to get rid of me since. All right, and <laughs> it's all I ever wanted to do. Mm-hmm. They asked me what I wanted out of school, and I said out. <laughs> <laughs> I had no use for being in school. I'd rather been out on a tractor somewhere. If it wouldn't have been for VOAG and industrial arts, I never would have graduated. Mm-hmm. And like you were farming with your dad for 20 years before 
you know, the organic thing came along. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was a fight. Yeah. So what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Was it just him seeing the changes or was there something that happened that really? It was money. I mean, I hate to sound like a greedy little capitalist, but it suited us to begin with. And we were to the point, in fact, in 2000, summer of two, or spring of 2003, if we said nothing happened by the end of the year, we were selling the cows. Because we, were, we weren't losing a lot of money, but I don't like working for free. You know, and we just was doing the numbers and why are we doing this? And then uh, I had been looking at it and things slowly started to fall into place that by fall, Jim Wiedeberg said, you know, be on the truck. Mm -hmm. We had just made up our minds. Something was going to change. We couldn't keep this up. We were looking at raw milk. We were looking at anything else. You know, what can we do to survive? But it wasn't. It didn't take a lot of convincing to get your dad to go that direction. Once the opportunity he, with Jim came, he, oh, once the opportunity with Jim came, he was like, "Let's get rolling." What are we waiting okay. for? I mean, up until that time, like I said he, he was trying for a high production, high, you know, high value registered Holstein mm -hmm. herd, and as that sort of faded in in. Uh, in, in profitability, you know, we're looking at what can we do. I mean, we had quit feeding bean meal four years before that, just because we, the one year the bean meal got so damn high, we started doing the numbers. We couldn't afford to feed it. We knocked it out. And we only lost four pounds of milk. What are we feeding bean meal for? You know, we just grow good hay and good corn and go from there. Mm -hmm. It, uh, you know, so we were. My dad was into Impro. Uh, if you're familiar with that that product, it's it, you know. Um, no, I can't think of the right word right now. Uh, probiotics. Probiotics and yeah. stuff like that. Long before it was, quote, a popular thing. I mean, the county agent came out and condemned us for it and everything else. And mm -hmm. But Dad just didn't like the idea of pumping cows full of drugs. I mean, we were having trouble with milkers at one point. We'd have cows shoot a high fever. He'd call the vet, you know, high fever and mastitis. And he got done calling the vet, he'd hit him with a whole bottle of what they called uh, second food, Impro. By the time the vet got there, the fever was gone. And the vet at that time threatened to sue Dad for practicing veterinary medicine without a license. Hmm. Really? Yeah. In fact, my dad and John Beckman, and I think there was two or three others on here, had to fly to Minnesota and sign a licensing agreement with Impro to be allowed to use the stuff. At that time, you had to have a license agreement with Impro. They flew to Minnesota, landed, signed the papers, got back on the plane, and flew home. Wow. It uh, <laughs> obviously it, worked. It, it's Everything works for a while. Mm -hmm. We've used other versions of the products. As that company has sort of gone through some real gyrations over the years, but it worked for us at the time. I said the one veterinary who now runs a drug distribution business of his own. Legal, our, legal drug oh, distribution. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's very legal. But... Uh, he had made the comment when he was our our regular vet. He said, I don't know what it is. He said, but I can come in here and treat a cow with antibiotics. And one treatment cures it. He said, I don't know what you're doing, but don't stop. You know, and he, he we had discussed it. I mean, later we had discussed it. He knew what was going on. It just had no immunity mm -hmm. to or no tolerance to antibiotics. We just didn't use any on the farm. We didn't. We didn't uh, bunch in the way of treating calves. We just got them on lactobacillus while they were drinking milk, and you know, always used uh, whole milk. We never used uh, replacer. milk replacer. We tried that one time, and Dad said between all the kids, nobody milked it the same or mixed it the same, and never got fed right. Anyway, it's just easier to take it out of the pipeline and feed the calves. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was it was never a wrenching change for us. It was more just we kind of flowed into it. A gradual. Ev evolution you might say yeah that all of a sudden oh now you're shipping organic milk and you probably don't even remember all the tough decisions and the steps to get through it because it happened gradually it happened real gradually <laughs> but i had to laugh the neighbor here that's since sold out he's an older bachelor but at that time he was he had had a uh contract with smith dairy and you know then they really treated smith really treated people good mm -hmm. And then he found out that Smith was processing our milk. He goes, well, that's good. He goes, that when that organic falls apart in a year or two, at least you'll have an end to get in at Smith Dairy. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
while we're still here. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Smith is still processing for organic value. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, he, was, he was just really tickled for us. That way when organic falls apart in a year or two, at least you'll be able to get in at Smith Dairy. <laughs> Where would your milk go from here? Does it go to Richmond, Indiana? I mean, or I mean, with, with OV? Yeah. All depends where they're sending it. Okay. For quite a while there, there were tankers going all the way to Florida. Okay. That's part of the reason Jim Wiederberg was excited about this area. We're right near I-75, you know, and we're really just can go just about any direction mm-hmm. from here. Okay. You know, versus Wisconsin, they're a little more up by themselves. And New England, that's sort of way off in the yeah. Which that's what they call uh, Ohio is really a swing region because of all the interstates and everything going in every direction. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it, it, that was... I remember one point when we had, uh, I had a laugh. They had picked, the driver at the time picked our milk up and he had picked up Hammonds and he was going across northern Indiana. And that's right when um, Steve uh, Kretschmer was, they were trying to figure out how he was routing loads and everything. And he got full and called the office and said, where's this load supposed to go? And they said, take it to Sugar Creek for reload. And he thought about a minute. He goes, uh, where does it go from there? Oh, Chaseburg for butter. <laughs> uh, I'm closer to Chaseburg than I am to Sugar Creek right now. He said, I heard all these papers rustling in the background. I was like, oh, crap, just keep driving. Just keep driving. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want the job of figuring out where oh, this milk goes. It's, it's absolutely um, They'd see me hanging from the ceiling after a while. <laughs> it's crazy where... Um, the milk in, in especially the more eastern part of Ohio goes because it goes into a reload and then it just explodes and goes every which way. So when people ask, well, where does the milk go? Uh, which day? You yeah, know, which load? Yeah. yeah. Around so, here, I think right now a lot of it's going down to Smith. Is it? But I won't say that'll be that way tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, there. But I just always got a kick out of that. It's just, just keep driving. Just keep driving. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guys. Yeah, I, I just. I don't know how they figure that out up there. The, uh, no, I, I, my dad always says, look, as long as the milk truck shows up and the check shows up, you don't ask questions. <laughs> Just make sure you don't park the driveway full so the milk truck can't get in. So how many farms would there, you're in what they call the Ohio West region. Right. How, how many farmers, Organic Valley farmers are here? Just right in this, close no, to me here? No, in Ohio West. Well, I see. Now you're, you're talking about that. All that the way also down. includes Southern Ohio, see, all the way down into Greenfield and that whole area. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many are down there. Okay, right. And see, there's a, there's a big gap. There's us up mm-hmm. here, and there's them down there, and there's nothing in between. Well, you've got Bell Center or the right. Uh, but I mean, it's it's not a continuous. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a large popula- large amount of them down south, mm-hmm. and then there's us up here, right up here around me. There's I think probably about seven of us. Okay. And are those all the original folks that you had talked to? Yeah, and yeah. And then, well, like uh, one of them left over the over raw milk. He's uh, he's been with Horizon, and now his raw milk business is dead. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we had uh, one other guy. We just well, you know what they talk about the milk bonanza when it, you couldn't get enough organic milk, and the one guy just couldn't get, still insist that a healthy jersey normally runs a million cell count. <laughs> <laughs> um, and believe it or not, he's selling raw milk now. Oh, great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was a show herd. Great guy, great cow people, but they only owned 12 acres and just couldn't get work, anything worked out with the neighbor to, to get more ground to graze. And they sort of went away. But overall, the majority of them that we had are still here. Because I, as a little kid, I knew Steve Gamby. Okay. Because he would, he was uh, neighbors and friends, and played on the same softball team as Gene Logston. So oh, when oh, I was a little, oh, wow. <laughs> a little kid, that explains Steve Gamby. <laughs> yeah. So they came in to play us Amish in softball, mm-hmm. and Steve Gamby played minor league baseball f- for the Detroit Tigers. Okay. And big dude could hit a ball oh, yeah. a mile. He was a big guy. So when I started working at Organic Valley seven years ago, I heard Steve Gamby. He well, I know Steve Gamby. It was just kind of a weird yeah. full circle moment. Well, I tried the first couple of years. I'd make it out to Steve's once a year and get up to Hammond's at least once a year. You know, the other ones around here are all within five miles. Mm-hmm. 
But uh, I hated to see Gamby quit, but I don't blame him. I mean, you got to retire at some point. Yeah. But he was always the nicest guy to deal with. Uh, and that was just sort of an out-of-the-blue thing. I drove all the way out there and met him. And, yeah, we'll, we'll make it work. Mm-hmm. And it, um, I, I, it bothers me. I can't get more people interested. But I'll tell you, the, the – I don't know what's the right word to use. The big agribusiness has just got such a hold out here. You know, I – and my son got in trouble in VOAG class. It, you know, I said, well, yeah, we got 250 bushel corn. Well, did you make any money on it? <laughs> well, we got 250 bushel. We had to. Did you make any money on it? You know, and the HH is finally going, Bob, I know what you're getting at. You better be quiet before they kill you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just, the, I look at the numbers that they're spending to put out corn crops. For $3 corn. Yeah. And I, I, I hear all these stories about, you just can't have you know, these articles. It's just so expensive to get into organic. Organic fertilizer is so expensive. I don't spend one fourth of what they do to put out a mm-hmm. corn crop. But you also have livestock. Well, which and I think that's what makes the the organic system I'm really talking run about well. other dairy farmers around yeah. here. Oh, you're talking other dairy. Yeah, farmers. and as far as around here, we're swimming in chicken crap. Mm-hmm. There's no problem getting. In fact, I even use a little bit of chicken manure on some fields. Mm-hmm. But I mean it. The manure, it, it's so the nitrogen is affordable and available. Oh, it's yeah, it's real available. Mm-hmm. The uh, it, it's um, we have more trouble around here with calcium, low calcium, and low sulfur than we do with 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 uh, phosphorus. Would there be would the chicken litter around here be broiler houses or layer? It's, all, layer? it's, it's about 75 percent layer, okay, because the layer of manure is actually has a lot of sulfur in it. Oh, yeah, it does, it. it does, mm-hmm. but unfortunately, it's, it's very slow release. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there, there's a lot. Oh, we're I don't remember the number anymore. How many hundreds of millions of chickens there are in this area? We've got uh, Cooper's, Cooper Foods. It's got turkey houses all over the place out here and broiler houses. And then there's um, uh, just one operation. Uh, what in the heck is the name of that? I can't think of the name of it right now. I think there's 100 million birds. I mean, these, and all the we used to have uh, a co-op out here that contracted eggs. Fort Recovery Equity. They finally told their producers, you put your own egg wash facilities in. If we have to wash the eggs, we can't make any money. So it's strictly, you got you got to ship semi-loads on your own. They won't clean eggs anymore. It's just all they do is provide feed. Oh, Guys wow. that don't have their own egg wash facilities are just about out. There's one small integrator left that, uh, Hemelgar and Egg is the only one left that will uh, do vertical integration and, and do the whole nine yards. Everything else just it's gotten so so damn big, you know. Just triple decker building after triple decker building after triple decker building, and mm-hmm. you know it, it's. And then there's just a lot of crap. Mm-hmm. When I think as far as like this this these big chicken houses and um, the way that these companies work, I think that's the big fear in the dairy industry right now. Is the same thing is happening. Well, I can tell you, and this this. When I was, you know, like a freshman in high school, I remember sitting in the bathroom was the only door in the house that had a lock. <laughs> <laughs> so you would sit on the, sit on the can reading Successful Farming and Farm Journal and Ohio Farmer. And there was a, sh- a shelf in there. It was always just loaded with farm magazines and everybody beating on the door. Get the hell out of there. I need the bathroom. <laughs> but I remember sitting and reading other oh, Successful Farming. And this was right when vertical integration and chickens took off and eggs. And I remember real well the, the experts all said, this is fine for poultry, but it'll never work in pork because it's too complicated. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, pork's miss- done. Uh, beef is damn near done. And so dairy's about the only one left. I think what's coming back on the beef side is the grass-fed side. It, it I is. Think, I think the grass-fed beef market, I just had a conversation with Sam Dobson last night, and... Uh, they're really excited about what's happening in their grass-fed beef. Beef, well, I said dairy and eggs are are, are are the hard ones because you can't beef. Anybody can slaughter a steer and put it up for sale. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't just eggs. You can even sell off the farm, but they have to be refrigerated. Dairy is a real pickle because it's going to be processed and handled and every day. Yeah, you know, it's not quite the same and. So that's I don't think beef beef has ever gotten a stranglehold. Chicken is so automated. I mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of chickens an hour flowing through Coopers or mm-hmm. turkey up here it's turkeys. And I always laugh. There's a 
he's a good guy down here, but he put up a turkey house for Coopers so his wife could quit her job uptown, take care of that turkey house, and take care of the kids. You know, and he was farming. Well, that was fine. The kids are about gone now, but they're up to four turkey houses. He's farming and runs a trucking business. And he said, one time, we're not making any more money than we made when we had one turkey house and I farmed the place. That, I'm sorry, but that to me would be the most depressing thing you could possibly do. Work four times as hard and have the same amount of money. Yeah. We had a neighbor here put up one of the first high rises around here. Little, I think it was like 65,000 birds, but it was a high rise, you know, and they had a big open house and there was a big high rise cage layer, you know, all automated packing, you know, packing and everything. And man, these guys were so enthused. This is the perfect family size operation. It will support you and the family for the rest <laughs> of your lives and all this. By the time it was done, they gave him an ultimatum. They would molt the chickens one more time. They would not put new ones in. If he wanted new birds, he had to put a 500,000 bird house up next to it. 500,000 birds. Yeah. Yuck. Yeah. I mean, that, but that's, that's just how it, you know, mm-hmm. well, it went from the fir- perfect family-sized operation for the rest of your life to being a detriment they didn't want to work with mm-hmm. in not even 25 years, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Well, and I was ready to put a cage layer house up. This looked great. I mean, working here, it's warm in the winter and, mm-hmm. you know, everything else. And I think it is. I didn't. It's like Wendell Berry said when we went down to see him in Kentucky. He said, these farms these days, you got to get the next greatest tractor. So you got to go buy more ground to pay for that tractor, which means you got to then go buy another bigger tractor, which means you got to buy more ground to pay for that bigger tractor. And it's just this endless cycle. Yeah. And it's the same thing happening, whether it's cropping, whether it's chickens, well, whether it's pork, beef. Didn't Wendell talk at one of the OV meetings a couple of years ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I sort of nailed him a little bit because he was talking about, well, now everybody's got to have a semi. And I talked to him in the hall afterwards and I said, you do realize you can buy a used semi and what we call a coal bucket for less than three new hopper wagons. And he didn't realize that. <laughs> That's why most of the guys around here, you see them with semis. They're, they're buying a used one. Used semis are cheap. Mm-hmm. It's cheaper than buying, buying some good hopper wagons. But yeah, overall, he is right. I mean, it's. Oh. So I've always been a little bit more of a fan of, of Logston. Mm. Contrary. Yeah, the contrary <laughs> farmer. Yeah. So. But yeah, he. Uh, no, it's. I, what's progress? I don't know. Yeah. The, the thing, it's this hamster wheel of success. Oh, I know. That just. I, I don't know, I, and I totally understand why people grow, especially if they want to bring the kids into the operation. Yeah, you know, I think the Stollers are a prime example of that. Oh, he's Rather, Scott is one smart cookie. Yeah, and instead of the kids each having their own farm, they just add acres, and the kids become a part of the LLC. Yeah. Okay, I I totally get that, but I look that at that completely different than I do just growing and growing and growing, so you can get shinier equipment and stuff like that. That to me. Maybe I'm just lazy, but that has never appealed to me as just... Well, we, we've got a neighbor down here. Uh, I won't say the name because they're, they're, they're known to be a little bit of land pigs. But he came down with cancer, and the chemo was going to ster- make him sterile. He was just married. They had one daughter. That's all they've got. And he just keeps buying farms and buying farms and buying farms. And it's like, what in the world drives him? He doesn't have anybody to leave it to. He's got one daughter. That's it. You know, it's not like he's well, got that's five, why, five that's kids. Why, that's why he's got money. He only has one kid. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> started out really well. Oh, uh, but no. It, it, but you wonder what drives some people mm-hmm. to constantly got. At what point do you say the same people will crab? They they just never get done. Mm-hmm. But they'll buy another farm. The same ones that'll crab. Young guys can't even afford to get started farming, and they'll outbid every young guy in the area to make sure they get it. Mm-hmm. What are the land prices around here? They've moderated a little bit. We were upwards, getting close to twenty thousand. Mm-hmm. They've they've backed off a hair, and I was worried when I paid forty five hundred an acre. Um, I bought my aunt's place here. Bought her last forty acres for seven. Okay. It, uh, but they, 
at one point my dad had a chance to buy the original home farm when he was started farming for four hundred dollars an acre and he said i turned it down i couldn't figure out how i was going to pay for it he says but milk was two bucks oh you know, but how is it? But, said, now, but, but look at, take that $2, a hundred for milk and $400 an acre. I know. Now, now go $12. That's six times. That's only $2,400 an acre. I know. I know. That's crazy. My dad used to be able to go out and buy a, he bought a uh, brand new John Deere 170 skid loader when they came out. And he went in he told JP over here at Willowdale Sales, he says, uh, I got, over half of it right now, the second half of the next milk check comes. Yeah, no problem. He nice. bought his forty-two thirty, paid for it in cash out of two milk out of the milk check. Now, no way. I remember he oh. bought a brand new pickup truck. He put put a thousand dollars for one milk check aside, and he had the rest in the second milk check and bought a new pickup truck. The only way you're doing that now is if you milk 10,000 cows. Yeah. And <laughs> but they're not going to have any money left over. No, but I'm, it, it, it is mind-boggling. Mm-hmm. It, we, well, my dad said, when he, clear back when he was in high school, his ag teacher said, the days are coming. You're going to work a whole hell of a lot more for a whole hell of a lot less. Mm-hmm. And he was about right. Mm-hmm. It, and that's why it's part of the reason. That, I said, what do you like about organic? I said, I, I only have so much land. I cannot compete with the land pigs around here. You know, I just can't go out and bid them up and bid them up. Uh, so I made up my mind I have to work smarter, not harder. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just going to have to learn how to turn more dollars off the same acreage. Mm-hmm. That's a, I mean, that's like I thought about my dad bought the tractor. We used to have a John Deere dealer that was four miles away. And not, I mean, I'm not complaining, really. The next nearest one's only 18 it is, or 20. It isn't that bad. <laughs> it's only about 18 miles. But they used to be right back behind the land. Mm-hmm. They were and they were a really an odd group. They sold John Deere and Oldsmobile. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't fair. They had all these brand new cars sitting in the showroom every time a farmer came in for parts. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's how the world has turned. Mm-hmm. My dad bought his first. first uh, he always had Massey Harris's. His dad had Avery's and then two cylinder Deers. And when they got into silo filling and stuff, they went they went to Massey Harris's to get something with a smoother power. From then the two cylinders. He bought the first one of the first forty tens ever sold when they came out. He bought a forty ten tractor with a loader on it and a five fourteens fully mounted plow. We junked the loader, junked the plow, and he got more for the tractor than he paid for the whole set together. No way. Now at the same year they also bought a four row planter. My grandfather also was a John Deere man. He was a two cylinder man, he just loved it the day he died. My grandfather lives twenty miles south of here over by Versailles. By the time the rumor got back around to him, his son-in-law was having his, all his machinery possessed by International Harvester. And my grandfather just rolled on the floor. He goes, what in the hell does International want with all that John Deere equipment? <laughs> <laughs> A four-row planner. Mm-hmm. Holy Lord, four rows? Now look at him. Yeah. What was that, a 1240? Yeah, it was... It was uh, I remember it was a 38. When he bought it, it was 42-inch rows. Mm-hmm. He had it down to 38s, and then we went to a six-row 30-inch, which really wasn't any wider. It just put more rows in. But, yep. you know, and I'm still using that size planner. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you look at somebody's, what, 24, 36, whatever. they got to pull them with a track, four-wheel drive track tractor trying to drag these things through the field. $250,000 tractor and an $80,000 planter for $3 80? corn. <laughs> 80? Yeah. Well, a cheap one. I might buy a half of one. Might buy, they're, they're more than 180, 200 and some thousand dollars to those 24 rows. Are they? Are you serious? I'm serious. And all the computer monitoring on it, one mouse will screw that thing up so bad it'll never work again. <laughs> uh, I mean, and I'm out here with an old 7,000 John Deere that I'm probably going to rebuild. It'll run a long time yet. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I have, he's got a 12 row he bought. Okay. Neighbor down here. Another organic farmer, and he just, man, you ought to buy a 12 row. They're cheap. I only plant 60 to 70 acres of corn a year. How big of a planter do I need? <laughs> so you can get done quicker. So you do what? Sit around or? <laughs> no, work harder so you can make less. I'm trying <laughs> to get to the point where I can sit around a little bit. I, I hate to I know. Be- I, I texted you and said I'm running a little bit early. And you said, ah, he can't take a nap now this afternoon. <laughs> there went my nap. <laughs> I'm 59. I like to take a nap after dinner. 
half an hour never killed anybody. Mm-hmm. And when it's zero outside, it can stretch into an hour and a half real fast. <laughs> or more. <laughs> I'm yep. sorry. That's my son's night or 20. And it's fun to watch your children work. Mm-hmm. And I, that sounds evil, but it's not. Mm-hmm. It, it, it is the joy of your life to watch your son work. Mm-hmm. That he's enjoying it and wants to do it. Watching your children work hard and take pride in what they're doing is the best feeling as a parent you could get. It is. That's, it is, and I, my dad has admitted that as much as he wanted to strangle me once in a while. You know, it's. <laughs> I don't think there's a dad out there who hasn't wanted to strangle their kids. Any parent who has never wanted to kill their children is a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I can imagine your dad more than once. It's just fingers were itching. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I deserved it too. <laughs> no, you love love your kids, and yep. no, he's Bob's been a blessing. It, mm-hmm. It's because uh, you, you get to the point where, I mean, my wife's from the city. Her, her her dad was a medical doctor. I drugged that poor woman out here, and I think I've shocked the hell out of her more than once. I remember her holding up the first pair of it. What in the world did you do to these pants? <laughs> we just cleaned a cow, um, but. Uh, she was after me at one point. Says you're just encouraging him. You know, you shouldn't be encouraging him. He's got to make up his own mind what he wants to mind what he wants to do. And I always told her, I said, honey, if he looks me in the eyeball and says he wants nothing to do with it, I will be making plans how I can retire. If he wants to keep going, I will do anything my dad did to keep mm-hmm. keep him going, give him the chance to go through the meat grinder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, it there's just some pride, and as another generation wants it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's the true definition of what you're doing is working if the next generation wants to do it. Maybe not even, and it has to work on from, an, from a financial and a profitability side too, but Bob saw something about the, what, the life you had yeah. that he wanted. Yeah, well, and not to sound all philosophical, but what are you doing your whole life anyway? You can work your tail off, all this stuff. You're raising your kids. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that matters out of the whole ball of wax, whether you live in the fanciest house in town or an old shack. Mm-hmm. You're raising your kids, trying to trying to get a little bit of enjoyment out of life, and mm-hmm. and it, it uh, yeah, it's it's and he's going to have a rough hoe of it. I mean, I think we're heading back into the same thing we had in the '80s, and it's not going to be an easy time. It, uh, it's hard to imagine that it'll get as bad as it was in the 80s. It's hard. To, they'll never contract hogs because it's too complicated. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's... It, 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 won't, it won't be the same, but it could, it could be just as bad mm-hmm. in different ways. I, uh, I mean, honestly, I could sell it right now and be a millionaire, but then I wouldn't have it anymore. Mm-hmm. You're never going to get it back. So right now with me fighting Stray Electric with the power company, if guys that want to just quit, well, then I've quit. You know, then I, the cows aren't going to come back. Because once cows leave a farm, the odds of there ever being cows milked on that farm is pretty much non-existent. Unless it's a f- five or 10,000 cow dairy, then they just cycle yep. it in for 10 cents on the dollar and no. refill it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but overall, yeah, once, once the family stops, it's done. Yep. I've, I've seen a lot of, lot, lot of that. Mm-hmm. And friends of mine that, you know, just... Sold the cows out, and well, you know, a couple of them. Well, the boys are not going to milk cows. I won't let them. You know why? Because they don't. They shouldn't have that life. They don't. It's not the kind of life they should have. What was so bad about it? It's just too damn much work. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with that? Well, hard work never hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. And when you're inherently lazy like I am, it doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can watch other people work. The old guy I bought this farm from, Otto Mesher was a wonderful old guy. About like having a third grandpa. And he'd stand out there. He was already in his 80s. And he says, well, they always told me as long as you like to watch other people work, you're not really lazy. <laughs> <laughs> he would, he'd work around for us on occasion and things like that. But he just loved to tinker around the barn and mm-hmm. kept busy. Yep. And that's what I want to do when I get old. Wife thought I ought to take up golf. I said, for the love of God, why? <laughs> that sounds terrible. Well, what are you going to do when you retire? I said, same thing I'm doing now. Just less of <laughs> Just, it. <laughs> but only when I feel like doing it. I'll be out in the back building somewhere working on a tractor or fixing something up or 
you know, when I feel like it, but that's my idea of retirement is doing right what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. And at 59, that sounds kind of bad talking about retirement already, but it's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the other thing, if I got rid of the cows, I wouldn't have any reason to go to the OV meeting every year, and that would really oh, that would tear me up. <laughs> hey, I tell you, you don't know how much that's meant to me. Mm-hmm. It's getting to be a little, it's a little bit like family. You just look more forward to seeing people every year. Mm-hmm. Except for a few of the cri- criers and complainers, but overall, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're glad to see everybody, some when they leave and some when they come. Yes. I mean, it's it's th- this whole predicament we're in now. I sometimes wonder if some of the screamers out west, if we'd have left them go right off the bat and not raise the price as high as what we did, we'd be all be a lot better off now. Mm. You know? Yep. I And I... Uh, I don't know. I, I really, I, there's times I just throw up my hands. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to keep on doing what we're doing. Try to do a little yeah. better job. Mm-hmm. Try not to screw up. Those yeah. are the days you're happy when the milk truck just shows up and the, and the milk mm-hmm. truck just yeah. shows up. <laughs> there's days you're just happy to go to bed and say it's over. <laughs> but, nope. yeah, it's, it, it's a wonderful life. It mm-hmm. sounds like a cliche, but farming is a wonderful life. Mm-hmm. I like that thing, your, that one video of your dad and said, Sometimes the biggest challenge is to be the kind of guy your dog thinks you are. <laughs> uh, I think it's, uh, may I be the man that my dog thinks I am? Something like that. Yeah, but I mean, it's mm-hmm. there are days when, oh, there's days you stand out back. <laughs> you just, just mm-hmm. blow a gasket. And, yep. But it's like one guy told me cows are cheaper than psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> You got a line, they just kick you. Yep. Yeah, I don't know what else to tell you about what we're doing here. It's, I, it's, I'm trying to raise a family and trying to do the best we can. Wouldn't yeah. be for my wife working out. My wife's an occupational therapist. She's been a real godsend. Mm-hmm. But the poor woman's driven 40 miles to work every day, four days a week since we've been married. Oh, wow. You know, the odometer in the old cars before they went digital, ours looked like slot machines. Click, 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 click. Yeah, um, uh, I don't know how much longer we got here. What time is it? We're, we're good to wrap it up whenever. Yeah. Okay, it's up to no. you guys. Yeah. I, unless you got some other questions for me, I'd, I don't. No, I don't I really. I, I really appreciated the history on your family immigrating here from Germany and how it yeah. went through the generations and. And now that it's going to the next generation, is it's really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that's that's my goal. If I can get it to the next generation, and at some point you stand back and say, "Well, it's his problem." Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's going to have to figure it out. It. Uh, my my mom when, mom always said that's the position they were in when when she when she was young. I mean, my dad's. It's kind of interesting. My dad's brothers were all, or my grandpa's Bolsher's brothers were all in the army. Okay. And he had a brother-in-law in the Navy, and but he was survi- eldest surviving son, and he was already married. So he was farming several farms. My grandmother was doing the work at home, and my mom was out helping milk the cows and do all the rest. And then he got a job at Frigidaire, and he'd hot bunk at Frigidaire all week. You know, one, three guys share in one bed. One guy get out for the next shift and just keep going through, head home every weekend, Work his tail off all weekend, up get a bunch of work done. He'd be gone again, and my grandmother and the kids would do the work, and that's how they paid the farm off. My grandmother always said, "I liberation my ass." She said, "I'm just li-. these women didn't know what liberated was," <laughs> you know, and that's sort of the attitude I got out of them. You know, it just that's all. It's, you just got to work at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, it's a interesting world. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Now make sure you chop two thirds of this off and get rid of the bit. <laughs> Oh, thanks a lot, Dave. We really yeah, appreciate hey. the time. Thank you, Dave. We yeah, really it's, it's, it's fun to do it. Thank you. Okay, bring the beer on.